Hallelujah to the Lamb. What an amazing God He is. All right, the 47th chapter of the prophet Ezekiel. If you have it, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Feel the anointing of God's Spirit here tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the thresh, threshold of the house eastward from the forefront of the house stood toward the east and the waters came down from under from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the outer gate by the way that looketh eastward and behold there ran out waters on the right side and when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. He brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters were to the lowens. And afterward, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the bank or the brink of the river. And now when I had returned, behold, all the bank, all, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea which is being brought forth into the sea the waters shall be healed and it shall come to pass that everything that liveth which moveth whithersoever the waters shall come shall what live there shall be a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come thither for they shall be healed and everything shall live whither the river cometh. It shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi, even unto Eniglim, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea according uh, exceeding many. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to the salt." And by the river upon the bank thereof, and on the side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meal, or meat, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issue out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing, God, to be upon the reading of your holy word. We give you all glory and honor and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Title of the message today is Ezekiel, Baptism in Ezekiel. Baptism in Ezekiel. So we see in the word of God here that Ezekiel is taken by an escort. The man that had the line in his hand. Of course, I believe that to be the Lord Jesus. And he was brought to the house. And as he was brought to the house, he saw out from underneath, and that's the Holy of Holies. Out from underneath the threshold, there was water that was flowing there. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us the source you have to go over to the book of Revelation to find out the source. And that's the throne of God. And Jesus is on that throne. So these waters are flowing out from the, amen, the throne of God. Flowing underneath the threshold of the temple. And as they flow out, they get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Amen. A thousand feet ankle deep. Another thousand feet knee deep. Another thousand feet low and deep. Another thousand feet so deep you cannot swim. Amen. 
as you go out from the temple. The Bible tells us the direction that they flow is eastward. First of all, he says he sees it from the south side of the altar or the right hand. So that speaks of the right hand of God. Jesus is on the right hand of God figuratively. So he's on the one that's on the throne, right hand of God with power and strength and might and salvation, etc. That's what the right hand speaks of. So we see then that the waters are flowing from the right hand of God, if you will, Jesus Christ. They're flowing by the altar and they're heading eastward. And then the Bible says God takes him. Somehow, I guess he walks around the, the temple precincts. He takes him to the north side. And he sees the same thing. Water's flowing out. So these waters are flowing from the throne. And they're flowing under the threshold. And they're moving out various directions, north, south, east, and west. Amen. As they flow so that the whole temple is filled with water. And it's flowing out from there, and it's going in various directions. And the western side of the temple, which is the back side of the temple, is the one that has the least amount of flow. But they're all getting flow. Every direction, this water is flowing out. And every direction that it flows to, it brings healing and it brings life to whatever it touches. And so we see that Ezekiel is taken by his guide here. And... He takes him out to the water that is ankle deep. Amen. That speaks of your walk with God. Then he takes him out another thousand feet, another thousand cubits, excuse me. Now it's knee deep. Now that moves into your prayer life and your worship. So if you understand, there's a progression that's going on here. But it started from the throne. What you're eventually going to see is that when you get out in the deeper water, it's deep enough to be baptized in. So what God is showing you as you begin to move toward the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, what is required to come into His presence is number one, baptism in water. And we know in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the name of Jesus. And then as He progressively moves back toward the temple, the Holy of Holies, now we move into ankle deep water, which speaks of a person after they've been baptized in Jesus' name, that they need only their feet, John 13, to be washed. That means once you and I get baptized in water in the name of Jesus, there's no need for you to get rebaptized every day, but every day that you live, you're getting contaminated by this world as you walk through this world. So you have to get your feet washed every day, even though you don't need to be baptized every day, in order to qualify to go into his presence. Because God is a clean God. Amen. My wife got a revelation of that not long ago. She said, God is not a dirty God. The God that you and I serve is not a dirty God. He is a clean God. So you cannot get into his presence without cleansing. And he provided that way to be cleansed by baptism. So you start out there in the deep water and you get baptized in water in the name of Jesus. And you progressively move toward the Holy of Holies, if you will. Having been baptized in water in the waters you can't even swim in. Amen. Now you move there to the low and deep water and that's the strength in in the time of conflict. Because low and speak of strength. So you've been baptized in Jesus' name, but as you go through life, you're going to need strength in your loins to be able to survive the conflicts, amen, that will come to you. But you've got enough water, enough strength from the glory of God that's flowing from the throne of God to give you the strength that you need, amen, to walk with the Lord. And I believe when a person first gets baptized in Jesus' name, that's when the greatest conflicts that they will go through at times will come to them because the devil's going to try to get them out of the kingdom of God. You get baptized in Jesus' name, and I've warned so many people right before they do this, you better be careful because the enemy is coming after you. And a lot of them don't even make it the next week. But what God is showing you is he's a clean God that we must be clean to enter into his presence. We start out by being baptized in water in the name of the Lord. And then we progressively move by his strength and power. Amen. At low and deep water. Amen. Then we go to the knee deep water. And I'm moving back toward the throne. 
And the deep, deep water is your worship. It's your prayer life. It's my prayer life. But then we finally make it back to ankle deep water, which speaks of our walk. And so every day of our life, we need to be cleansed. You're baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. But every day you live and every day I live, and you know what I'm talking about, we pick up dirt. And Jesus said in John chapter 13, he said, you don't need to be baptized, only you need to have your feet washed. So I've been baptized in Jesus' name, but every day of my life, I need to get my feet cleansed because I'm picking up the dirt and the filth of this world, praise God. But the good news is that he is the one who has provided the cleansing for us. You can't clean your own self up. You can't cleanse yourself. God is the one who provides the cleansing for us. But it starts in baptism. So we have in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel a picture of what a baptism, the necessity of that. Because if you do not have that, you cannot go into the presence of a clean God. Amen. Say praise the Lord tonight, church. Now, the Bible says this right now. Over in John, 1 John, let's read this in chapter 5. I'll give you a few scriptures here tonight. 1 John chapter 5, the Bible talks about a witness that you and I must have in our life. Amen. And it's the witness of water, blood, and spirit. Amen. Verse 5. 1 John 5, 5, who is he that overcometh what? The world. But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and what? Blood. So the, watch this, the altar in Ezekiel's temple speaks of the blood. But he said he came by what? Water and Blood. Those are the two things that the Bible designates to cleanse us. We need the blood and we need water. The blood is the altar. The blood is the cross. Amen. The water is the laver or the molten sea that we go down in water in the name of Jesus and we are cleansed of our sins. That's when the blood is applied to our life. But you have to have both blood and water to be able to approach God. So it says, Jesus came by water and blood. When they opened his side, out of his side came forth what? Water and blood. Even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear what? Record in heaven. Now these are manifestations of God. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are what? It doesn't say these three are three. It says these three are one. Amen. Now look at verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Amen. Amen. Now listen what he says in verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, amen, God, hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. Now notice what it says. We receive the witness of God. What is the witness of God? We have the same witness. The water, the blood, and the spirit. We have that witness on the inside of us that we are children of God because we have that witness. We have the blood. We have the water. We've been baptized in Jesus' name. The water and the blood applied to our life. And we've been filled with the Holy Ghost. That is the witness that we have that we are a child of God. Amen? Very, very powerful. 
So we see Ezekiel then. We have the altar which speaks of the blood. We have the water now that's flowing from the threshold which speaks of the laver or the brass, molten brass which was not in this temple. It was in the temple of Solomon. The brass, the molten brass um, uh, bath was there. The lavers were there. We have a laver in the tabernacle, but it is not here. What God is doing, he's showing you he's replacing the molten sea with the water flowing from his throne. Everybody with me here today? So what Ezekiel is showing you is what God requires in order for us to enter into his presence. We must be cleansed. We must be baptized in water. And we know in the Bible in the name of Jesus for the remission of our sins. Now this water also speaks of typically not only of water baptism, but it speaks of spirit baptism. Because in John chapter 7, Jesus said this, if you believe as the scripture has said, out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit that they that believe on him should receive. So when I preach to you this message, I'm talking to you tonight about how you get in the presence of God. It's by being baptized in water in the name of Jesus. And it's being filled with the spirit of the living God. And that's the only way that you and I can get into the presence of the living God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And as we progressively understand this, it is interesting to me that God touches every area that we need. Amen. Our walk, ankle deep water. Now I can preach it in the reverse way. And say, okay, we got ankle deep water close to the throne. We go out further. We've got knee deep and low and deep. And then out there, we can't even swim. That's God is inviting us into deeper walks and revelation of himself. Amen. We understand that correctly. Amen. Ankle deep water is my walk. Knee deep water is when I'm worshiping and I'm praising God. I'm moving into deep, knee deep water. As I continue to do that, I will move into low and deep water. And that's where I get the strength I need. To overcome conflicts in my life. And then I can get to a place where I can't even swim. It's so deep. It's a torrential flood that is spinning around me. This is the spirit of the living God. Amen. Say praise the Lord. But God is showing you. And I just want to say this. God is showing you that he is a clean God. He is not a dirty God. Every, if you're going to approach God, there must be a cleansing in our life. And who is that that gives that to us? Jesus is the agent of cleansing. He's the only one that can cleanse you and make you ready to enter to his, into his presence. Amen. You cannot clean yourself up. You have to have somebody clean you up. And that's God himself. And so it's coming from the throne. It's flowing from the throne of God, Jesus Christ. And it's going out and healing everything that it touches with the exception of a few places. Amen. It's an amazing, amazing picture of God's salvation for us. Water baptism. And also spirit baptism. It says it goes out and it heals the waters. It's going to touch the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, as it flows out. Amen. The Salt Sea is 25% salt. The oceans that you are familiar with are about 4.5% salt. So that shows you the saltiness of the Dead Sea. It is so salty, brothers and sisters, that you can get in that water and that water will hold you up. Amen. Amen. At the surface, it will literally push you back out to the surface because it's so thick with salt. Nothing can live in that Dead Sea. You understand? It is so salty, it, all that's there is death. Birds, from what I understand, birds don't even fly over the Dead Sea. It is a place of death. It's a place, and in fact, it's a picture of the lake of fire. Because there are times when the Dead Sea will just catch on fire in different places in that sea. So it's a picture of death. It's a picture of the lake of fire. It's a picture, if you will, of somebody. If you were to go swim in there tonight, you could literally go swimming and it holds you at the top of the water. 
It's a picture of the lake of fire where the lost will be who are not cleansed by the living water, Jesus Christ, who are not cleansed by God's saving power. They will end up in the Dead Sea, which is a picture of the lake of fire, and they will literally like be buoyant to the top of the water and float in the fire of the lake that is there. But God says when he comes that the light that he's going to bring is going to be a life that is even going to reach into, listen to the, reach into the Dead Sea and purify it. He's going to change it from being death and saltiness and bring life to that situation. Jesus is the only one that can get you out of the lake of fire. He's the only one that can get you out of hell tonight. He's the only one that can get you out of that place. He's the only one that can heal, amen, that place. That is a type of the, de- of the lake of fire. And so 25% saltiness. And one reason for that is because the river Jordan only flows into it. So it's a, it's, it's a picture of something that only receives. That doesn't give. The Dead Sea doesn't have an outlet. It only has a place where something flows into it. This is a picture of an individual who only receive but never have an outlet to give. A person that is like that that never gives but only receives in their life is a dead sea. The birds don't even want to fly over their life because they are so dead. You must have a place where you receive, but you also must have an outgo where you give. Amen. And when you give and you let that flow, amen, that river flow through you, it's going to bring life to you. Are you hear what I'm saying? See, God intends you to be a river flowing through. When blessings come to my life, it's not so I can dam them up and keep them all to myself. When blessings come to you, brothers and sisters, you're supposed to be a conduit that's to flow through you. Amen. Praise God. And the more you give, the more flow will come to you and the more life that you will have. But the moment you stop saying, well, I'm not going to be a giver, I'm only going to get. As, long, as soon as you stop praising him and you stop worshiping him and you stop singing unto him and you stop praying unto him, then you're damming up the flow of the river of God's spirit in your life. And you and I will become dead seas. God doesn't want us just to receive. He wants us to give. Amen. What an awesome blessing it is tonight to be a divine conduit for God to flow through our lives. But God says... That river that flows, when it touches that, that salty sea, it's going to heal that salty sea. Amen. It's a sad thing, no outlet there. He goes on, he talks about that place. It's going to be so transformed, there's going to be trees growing on the sides. Amen. There are no trees growing on the side of the Dead Sea. Trees won't even go around there. It's nothing but death and desolation. But when God heals that, there's going to be trees that are going to grow. grow. And the Bible says there's going to be healing for the body, medicine in the leaves. What an amazing God he is. The fruit shall give you food to eat and the leaves will give you medicine, amen, to be healed by. And so this is a picture of God's healing salvation that comes To you and to me. Say praise the Lord church. He says not only trees are going to be on the banks there. But there will be fishermen there that are fishing. They will cast their nets into the water. And draw fish out of that place. Just like they would in the Mediterranean Sea. Now they're doing that in the salt sea. Drawing out fish because the waters have been healed. Amen. But the Bible said there's a danger zone. Because there's some areas that will be given to salt. Amen. Verse 11 says, the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to the salt. Amen. That's a danger zone. Amen. God wants to heal everything, but there are certain things that aren't going to be healed. It's a danger zone. Amen. So when we look at this, it's a very powerful picture of the saving power of God, the life that he brings to us. And to illustrate that, then, because this replaces the molten sea, I want you to go to 1 Kings chapter 7. And I want to teach you about that molten sea of which this is, if you will, a picture of. God gives us 
understanding in his, in his word about the need for cleansing. That he is a clean God, not a dirty God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 23, if you're there, say amen. Amen. He made a molten sea, 10 cubits. Now, we're going to go through this very quickly. For us to understand even more about these waters that are flowing, the picture of baptism and the picture of the Spirit that is in our life, that we have a witness of salvation because I'm baptized in water, I'm filled with the Spirit of God. I've got the blood, the water, and the Spirit. Amen? Amen. For us to understand this, we need to look at Scripture. So we're going to start here with the molten sea, of which this is a picture, a type of. Now, verse 23, it says, he made a molten sea, a molten sea. Say, a molten sea. sea. In the temple of Solomon, you had this huge molten sea or bath, if you will. And you also had lavers as well in the temple. In the tabernacle, you only had a laver. Y'all remember that? Okay, you got that altar, then the laver in the outer court. Go in the holy place. You've got the showbread. You've got the altar of incense. You've got the menorah. You go in the holy of holies. You've got the ark of the covenant, right? Okay. In the temple of Solomon, you had this huge sea, if you will, a molten sea made out of brass along with lavers. They basically teach the same thing. In Ezekiel chapter 47 The water that flows from underneath the threshold of the temple replaces this. But for me to understand that, I've got to go back to this. Okay? So the Bible says in verse 23, he made a molten sea. What is a molten sea? It is something that is molded. Okay? It's it's cast, if you will. Uh, I don't know if you ladies, any of you ladies have ever molded anything, but you pour maybe um, plaster into a cast and, uh, and it turns into a certain form, right? Well, God is telling you that this sea was molten, amen? It was formed, if you will, by putting it in a cast. Everything that I'm preaching to you, whether it be the waters of Ezekiel flowing under the threshold or this piece of furniture here speaks of Jesus Christ. So when it says it it was molten or it was formed, if you will, or cast, this is the different forms that Jesus came to us in to bring salvation to us. Just very briefly, one of the forms he came to us in was in the form of a servant. Amen. He is the God-man, but he came in the form of a servant, amen, to save us. He was in the form of the sin offering on the cross. When he died on the cross, he took that form, the form of a sin offering. So there were various forms that Jesus, when he came into this world, moved in in order to provide for us cleansing and salvation. So it says it's a molten seed. That means it's formed from a cast. Then he says, he gives us the size of it, 10 cubits. 10 cubits from one brim to the other. So if you measure it from side to side, 10 cubits would be the distance from one side to the other side of this bath. So that's about 15 to 20 feet uh, in size. So it's a fairly large bath, if you will. 15 to 20 feet across. Then he tells you the height of it. It's five cubits. Five cubits is about seven and a half feet, maybe to ten feet tall. So this is a very large bath. Fifteen to twenty feet in breadth. Um, If if, if we got five cubits high, seven and a half feet to uh, five cubits high, seven and a half to ten feet tall. So that would take you basically, if you were to put it in here, probably if you put it on this floor right here, you would reach to the ceiling. So it's a very large bath. Okay, amen? Amen. Now, uh, we have the 10 width or the breadth of it. 10 is divine order. Is divine order. Amen. Everybody understand that? How many commandments are there? 10 commandments. Divine order. 
How many times did, did the Bible say in the book of Genesis when God was dealing with chaos, how many times did the Bible say God said? If you go back in the book of Genesis, you will find out that when God is seeking to bring um, form, if you will, out of chaos, he said, the Bible says 10 times, and God said, and God said, and God said. So God is bringing, amen, out of chaos. When he does that, again, divine order, he say, his, it says 10 times that God said. 10 is the number of the tithe. So that is my responsibility is to bring 10 divine order in my life to God. That is the tithe. Amen. And so the Bible is so full of these things. I don't have time to get into all of them just to give you a little idea about what these dimensions mean. So 10 in breadth, 15 to 20 feet in width, and then five cubits high. About seven and a half feet to 10 feet tall. Deep. That's pretty deep. Yes, Amen. Amen. I mean, think about it. That's, if you got a swimming pool, uh, say a seven and a half foot swimming pool, that's pretty deep. That's over your head. But it's 10 feet, that's even deeper, right? Okay. So this thing is really deep. About seven and a half to 10 feet deep, if you will. Now, what is the number five then if it's five high? Five is the number of grace. Say grace. There is the fivefold ministry in the kingdom of God. What is the purpose of the fivefold ministry? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. The number five. The number of grace. Amen. So Jesus, God provides cleansing for us by grace. Five wounds in his body. Do you understand? Okay. Fivefold ministry. The purpose of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, fivefold ministry is to present to you the cleansing of God. Amen. That's the purpose of it, of the ministry, is to present to you the cleansing of God. Amen. So when you come here tonight and you are all troubled and you're full of problems in your life, the fivefold ministry will offer you the bath of the molten sea. And show you in your trouble, in your problems, how you can be cleansed. Amen. That is the purpose of the fivefold ministry. So it's five cubits high. The grace of God, fivefold ministry, five wounds in the, in the body of Jesus, so on and so forth. Amen. Now it continues here. And a line of 30 cubits to compass it round about. So we got 30 cubits in circumference. That is large. 30 cubits, if it's, 50, if it's a foot and a half, that's 45 feet in a circle. If it's two feet per cubit, that's 60 feet. That's a 60 feet bath. 45 to 60 feet. That's basically, so you'll understand, this building right here is 60 by 60 by 60 by 60. And I know that because when we had to put the carpet down and everything we had to do, I had to know how big it was. So if you just kind of look around, if you want to know how big 60 feet is, just look in this room. Okay? So it's 60, in, 60 feet in circumference around. It's 7 and a half to 10 feet deep. It's 10 feet wide, amen, or 10 cubits wide which is 15 or 20 feet wide. So this is a massive deal. Okay. Everybody awake? Well, what does the number 30 speak of? The number 30 speaks of ministry. It speaks of maturity. Say maturity. It is the number of maturity. So when Jesus Christ came to the Lord, he fulfills all of these things. Amen. He is the one by grace that presents cleansing to us. He fulfilled the law requirements for us. Took our place on Calvary because we have not kept it. 30 cubits in circumference. That is Jesus. When he came, he did not die when he was a little boy. He died in his fullness. As a full grown man. As a mature man. He died for us in his fullness. There was nothing lacking in him. He was perfect, if you will. Say, praise the Lord. 
Now, you go through the Bible, you'll see over and over this number 30, and I don't have time to get into all the details. It would take me about five or six hours to preach on this one piece of furniture if I got into all the details. But you remember there's a man by the name of Judas Iscariot. How many pieces of silver did he betray the Lord for? How many? 30 pieces of silver. That means that Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed the Lord, had maturity in his grasp. But he threw it away. It's a picture of so many people who start out walking with the Lord and they're growing and they're growing and they're growing and they're being perfected, they're being cleansed as they walk with God. But just when they're about to move into maturity, they've literally got it in their grasp. They take it and throw it away. Amen. So you and I, by the word of God tonight, we are to grow up in him which is the head. Brother and sister, you ever stop growing? You are in the, as I said before, that area of the marshlands that's not healed. You are in great danger because you're in the danger zone because there's no longer life in you. There's no more longer growth in you. It's a, just a place of death. Say praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. All right. So that's the first verse. And under the brim of it... Round about, there were knobs compassing it, 10 in a cubit. So if you've got 10 in a cubit and you've got 30 cubits circumference, you've got 300 of these knobs. Luke's neighbor said, I got 300 knobs. What is a knob? Luke's neighbor and say, What's a knob? Well, it's basically like an apple, okay? A cucumber, that's, but it's in more of a gourd type shape. It's round. So you've got these, amen. As the Bible says, 10 in a cubit. So you've got 300 of these cucumber, apple-like ornamentations. Why is there 300 of them? Come on, tell me why there's 300 of them. You know. Who went out with 300 men? Who? Gideon. What happened when he went out with 300 men? He won the battle, didn't he? Say praise the Lord. So 300 then is the number of victory. So we have victory in our conflict. Just like that water that is in low and, low and deep. Victory in conflict. We have victory in conflict because of the cleansing power of God that comes to you. And the church, the purpose of the ministry is when you come to the house of God all troubled and weighed down and burdened down and all kinds of problems in your life. When I preach this to you and tell you that Jesus is your cleanser, I am telling you that he's come to you by grace. He fulfilled the law. He's the perfect man. Amen. And he has brought victory and out to our life by his cleansing power. Something I can't do for myself, but it's something that God does for us. Now, not only do these 300 apple-like, if you will, ornamentations there on the brim of the molten sea speak of victory in battle, but the very brass that was used to make the molten sea came from the victories of King David over the enemy of God's people. In the tabernacle, whoo, I feel the Holy Ghost. In the tabernacle, we had the laver, the brass laver that was made from what? The looking glasses of the women. Now you sisters, you better know that. You better not have forgotten that. That laver was made out of the looking glasses of the women of Israel. Say praise the Lord. Polished brass. If you will, they gave up earthly beauty for heavenly holiness. I'm going to let you think about that and respond again. God beautifies the meek with salvation. So when you got in the church, what the world calls beautiful... 
You surrendered it and put it in a place of cleansing. Instead of, instead of living the world's definition of beauty, you went for heavenly holiness. But the molten sea here was made out of brass, but it wasn't made out of the looking glasses of the women. It was made out of the brass that David won in battle over the enemies of God's people. Woo! See, the enemy don't like what I'm preaching. Because if you ever understand the cleansing power of God in your life, there is nothing he can throw at you that you cannot overcome and be victorious over. Because you got the number 300 stamped on your forehead. You got the number 300 stamped on your life. Woo! I told you it'd take me about five hours to preach this if it really got into it. See, that's what these waters flowing out from the threshold are all telling you about. So we got 10 in a cubit, 30 cubit circumference, 300 of those knobs. Say knobs. Knobs. I call them knobs, but knobs, whatever. They were cast in two rows when it was cast, molded. It stood upon 12 oxen. Did you see that? Say it stood upon 12 oxen. So you've got three oxen facing north, south, east, and west, a total of 12 oxen. And that bath, if you will, that molten sea is on the backs of that oxen. Amen? Say praise the Lord. Why on the backs of oxen? And why the number 12? Because 12 speaks of divine government. It speaks of apostolic government. There's 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we are literally, the 12 apostles of the Lamb are presenting you the cleansing aspects of God's work. Yeah. Say praise the Lord, church. So there are 12 principles of truth that this cleansing power is based upon. And I'm going to try my best to remember them, okay? Death, burial, quickening, resurrection. Are you with me? Ascension and seeding. Six of those things. You said 12, Pastor. That's right. I gave you six. Why is it 12? Because the six I just gave you are duplicated in you. So listen to me. That's why the message of the apostles is so important for us to preach. Because the truth that we preach, the apostles' doctrine, if you will, is the message that will be cleansing to your life, bring salvation to your life. If you depart from the 12 oxen, if you depart from the apostolic government or divine government of God Almighty, you will not be cleansed. You cannot be saved without apostolic truth in your life. In John 17, Jesus, high priestly prayer, he said, neither do I pray for them, these apostles, but I also pray for those that will believe on me through their word. You have to believe on Jesus, and I have to believe on Jesus a certain way, and it's according to their word. So that base then, that C, is on the back of 12 oxen. And they're presenting, those apostles present to us the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. Death, burial, resurrection, quickening, ascension, and seated times two. Oh, this is, this is amazing stuff. Now, if you study, I believe it's 1 Kings 16, you will see a man by the name of Ahaz. His kingdom was not a clean kingdom. It was a dirty kingdom. And you know what he did? Ahaz, King Ahaz, God's own supposedly king, took this molten sea off the back of the oxen and put it on a paved stone. What God is showing you, there is no cleansing then in that kingdom when you take it off of the foundation of apostolic truth. 
You have to have that, those principles of truth that bring salvation and cleansing to the people. Amen. If you don't, what you've done, and so many religions have done that today, they have taken the molten sea off the back of the 12 apostles and put it on their own stone, and there is no cleansing there. It's a dirty kingdom. Praise the Lord. Now, later on, the Bible talks about that King Nebuchadnezzar, when he, divide, when he destroyed Israel, he took that molten sea and he tore it to pieces. Amen. Destroyed it. To him, it was nothing but junk metal. And that's Babylon. Whether she be the harlot riding on the back, on the back of a scarlet-colored beast, a false church system, or government system, that Babylonian system will always seek to take out the apostolic truth from your life and completely destroy it because what you and I believe and what you and I preach to a Babylonian system is nothing but a piece of junk. But without this, there is no cleansing. It must be on the backs of the apostles. It must be built upon the 12 principles Six in him and six in you in order for there to be cleansing. But if there is, you are clean tonight by the blood. You are clean tonight. You are cleansed. And he provided it for you and for me. Look at your neighbor and say, it was made out of brass. King David went and defeated the enemies and he took that brass from defeated enemies and God said you put that in that molten sea it's different from the labor how many of you ladies today are thankful that you exchanged earthly beauty for heavenly holiness and you know what I'm telling you today brothers and sisters because whether it be the labor or whether it be here the enemy is going to always be after that always after that Oh, this is too extreme. Oh, no, it's not too extreme. You have typical truth in the Bible that declares to you as a woman of God what you have done for the glory of your king. Say praise the Lord. Well, some of you sure are quiet tonight. Three looking toward the east. And the sea was set above upon them, and all their hinder parts were inward. Now, what's interesting, if you study this, the Bible doesn't tell us this, but if you study it, it is believed that through the mouths of those oxen flowed this living water that was in this bath. That there were pipes that came from that sea, that molten sea with the water in it, and those pipes went through the oxen, and there was, if you will, a... A, a spout there that they could open in the mouths of those oxen and that water would flow. And when that water flowed, first of all, if you were a new priest, they took you, they pitched a tent. You know, in the Old Testament tabernacle, we taught you this before. They would take a priest, they would pitch a tent, and they would go get water out of that laver. And they would wash that priest from head to toe, baptism. In Jesus' name. How can I say in Jesus' name? Because the Bible said that rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. And the water flowed out of that rock, which was Christ. So when we're they were baptized, that priest was baptized in the Old Testament. They were baptized in Jesus' name, water. Oh, I got Holy Ghost all over me right now. And then thereafter, they would do what? They wouldn't get baptized again because they'd already done that. But they would need their feet cleansed because every day they would pick up dirt. So they would go to the labor from then on and just wash their feet and their hands as they ministered before God. Because they knew they could not approach his presence if they were dirty. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you tonight, I present to you the cleanser. Verse 26, now think about that. 
So that water flowing through the mouths of those oxen. Just like tonight as I stand here and I preach you apostolic truth. That water is flowing out of the mouth of the oxen, the apostles of Jesus Christ. And it goes out to you and it cleanses you, brothers and sisters. And it heals your dirty places. It heals your marshy places. It heals your dead places. Today, you're alive in Jesus Christ by the power of His Spirit. Because He is the cleansing agent. Woo! You say, Pastor, where are you getting all this? About 40 years of study. Say praise the Lord. Give God. Oh, you want me to tell you? You want me to give you a little idea? There's a, there's a guy who wrote about three books. One on the tabernacle of Moses, the tabernacle of David, and the temple of Solomon. And he touches a little bit on the temple of Ezekiel. His name was Connor. You get his books, you got everything you need. Almost. Almost except the messages that I'm preaching. Amen. Say praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, this is well-known truth. I say this is well-known truth. What, in case you don't know it, what I'm preaching to you today is the ABCs of the gospel. Amen. And the ABCs of the gospel were laid out in the Old Testament pictures of tabernacle of Moses, tabernacle of David, and the temple of Solomon. And now we see it fulfilled in the church, in Jesus Christ, in the church. And we see in Ezekiel's future temple, there's still the need for cleansing. So what I'm about to tell you, I have never heard one apostolic preacher say in my life. But as I meditated on this, that in Ezekiel future temple, where we have cleansing flowing out, that teaches me that those that are mortal in their bodies, say born to those that entered into the kingdom age, they will need to be baptized in water in the name of Jesus in the kingdom age. You didn't hear me. Paul said, or the book of Acts in Acts 15, the Bible said that the residue of men upon whom my name is called. There's going to be some people left over that are going to have the name of Jesus. They're going to be, let me tell you, brother, so there's going to be people getting baptized in Jesus' name in the tribulation period. And if I understand the scripture correctly, there's going to be people who are born to those who enter into the kingdom of God that need to be cleansed. And in the kingdom age, there's still going to be people baptized in Jesus' name. And I've never heard any apostolic preach that. And I've never even heard any apostolic preach that these waters flowing from Ezekiel's temple is baptism in water as well as spirit baptism. Are you with me? God is amazing, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. The truth that we preach on the backs of 12 oxen. Oh, hallelujah. Buy the truth and sell it not. Woo! You are different. I didn't say you're better. I said you're different than the religious churchianity of this world. If you're baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. What makes you different is the name of Jesus. So for all you tonight who are so depressed and down and you know, brothers and sisters, you, we need to start believing. Not just hearing the word, we need to start believing it. There should be a transformation in your life from week to week. You should be going from glory to glory. And if you're not being changed by the word of God you hear preached, then you're in marshy territory, which is the danger zone. Man, I'm, I'm holding out for you. Everything you need tonight to overcome the enemy, to overcome your problems, to overcome your troubles. Everybody said amen. amen. Said on the brim of it, verse 26, a cup, say with flowers of lilies. Just orna ornamentation. This is what God does. Makes your life beautiful. Hallelujah. Even on a Wednesday night. Because I'm preaching to a lily people. Amen. What, what do we do normally on Resurrection Sunday? You call it Resurrection Sunday or Saturday. We, we know the truth, right? But what, what flower do you pick? The lily. Why? Because it's a symbol of the resurrection. 
This brings life just like Ezekiel talked about the living waters. See, brothers and sisters, this is Jesus that I preach to you. This is Jesus that I preach to you tonight. He is this. He is alive. But this, watch, this basin, this sea, molten sea is round. It's not like the altar which has a square, which has rectangle or square from one point to the other. It's round. That means the cleansing that he provides is eternal. It'll get you through the church age. It'll get you through the kingdom age. It'll get you beyond any age that's coming because what God provides for you is an eternal cleansing. That's why that molten, molten sea is circular. It's eternal. Verse 26, these lilies around it, you know. Also, the Bible says, have you ever noticed the lilies? They toil not. What did Jesus say, Christina? They spin. They don't spin. They don't toil. You don't see them out there, you know, in the field, weaving their beauty. Working really hard to be a, you know, amen, to be a lily. They just are. They're not toiling. They're not spinning. They're not laboring. They're just resting in Him. The one who planted them in that soil. I'm preaching to a lily people tonight. The problem is you need to start valuing what you are hearing. Somebody said praise the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say I'm a lily Christian. I've got resurrection life in me. I'm resting in my Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise. We are laboring, but we're laboring to enter into that rest. And how do we do that? By faith. So praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. I won't keep you long. I see you getting tired. He made ten bases of brass, four cubits was the length, of one base, four cubits the breadth of the three cubits height and the work of the bases. So now we're moving to the labors, but we're not going to go into that tonight. But isn't he amazing? He is amazing. Don't be an Ahaz that takes that bath off the back of 12 oxen and puts it on a stone pavement because you don't have cleansing anymore. You've got a dirty kingdom, and you can't approach God like that. Amen? Well... Who is this? Just as I told you, the waters that were flowing out from underneath the threshold there, we didn't know who that was or who it was coming from. But the Bible tells us who it is. It's Jesus. He's the agent of cleansing tonight. Tell your neighbor, he's the agent of cleansing. And I'm going to go to Revelation 4 in just a minute. Amen. But before I do that, I want to go to the book of Job. As I come to a close tonight, and I want to ask you a couple of questions. Amen. Job 25. An amazing, amazing question. I don't know why it's so hot in here. I'll just read the whole chapter because it's really long. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 1. Then answered Bildad, the shoe, shoe height. You know, you're in bad shape if you're only shoe high. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. See, there are short people in the Bible. Then answered Bildad, the shoe height, and said... Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. Is there any number of his armies? And upon whom doth not his light arise? How then can man be justified with God? What a question. How can a man be right with God? Justified with God. Or 
How can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even the moon, to the moon, it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm and the son of man which is a worm. How can a man be justified with God? How can man that is born of a woman be cleansed? I'm telling you, Jesus is the one. He's the cleansing agent. He showed you this. Amen? Nicodemus. <clears throat> Jesus looked at Nicodemus one day and he said, Except you be born again of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The throne room. The kingdom of God. You got to be baptized in water and spirit before you can go in there. Because he's a clean God. But he cleansed us. Now Nicodemus goes, hmm. How then can a man be born again? Does he enter back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, no flesh, amen. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not unto you that I say to you, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Jesus said, if you go back into your mother's womb and you come out again, you fail to understand that's where the problem began with. <laughs> because when you were born from your mother, you were in the first Adam. And the first Adam fell and brought a sin nature to you. So to go back to mama, which is born to be born of a man, how can I be clean that it's born to a man? It's not going back in being born again from a woman. It's being born again of the water and the spirit. Say praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. That's how we got in the trouble we're in. We were born of a woman. Hallelujah. And so we got the sin nature of Adam. That came upon us because of his failure in the garden. And then secondarily, we've got another problem because we committed sins ourselves. So we need cleansing for both. Original sin, nature, and the acts of sin that we commit. So Nicodemus, don't think it's going back, climbing back into mama and coming back out again. That's not going to help you. That's the way you got your problem. <laughs> Say praise the Lord. That's the way you, you, you were in that old Adam. But you got to get in a new Adam. Because as Corinthians says, everybody that's in Adam shall die. Woo, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. But everybody that's in Christ shall be what? Made alive. So we have the first Adam. If you're in him, you die. Because you've got a sin nature from, the, from him. So you've got to get out of the old Adam into the new Adam, Jesus Christ. How do you do that? When you get baptized in water in Jesus' name, you exit the old Adamic race and you enter into a new family of God. And the Bible says he features everybody in heaven his name by that one name. If, you're, if you are going to go to heaven, you've got to have that name. And so what's happened is the way you got out of the old Adam, death, is by entering into the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Life. He is your life. And the way you did that was baptized in water in the name of Jesus. Say praise God. So an amazing question, isn't it? <laughs> I'm having so much fun tonight. And I could tell when we first started, y'all didn't think it was going to be any good. <laughs> But remember, God's in the house. <laughs> Praise the Lord, man. I feel so good. I feel so good. Hallelujah. Titus 3, 5. Let me go there. And then we'll go over to the book of Revelation. And I'll let you go in just a minute. Amen. Are y'all all right out there? Hallelujah. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Would you see something so beautiful in the Word of God today? Hallelujah. 
not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. He just gave you the answer to Job 25. How can a man that's born of a woman be cleansed? How can a man be just before God? He tells you right now, by the washing of regeneration. Now listen to me very carefully. I'm going to look and see if it's in my Bible. It's not in this one. But there are some Bibles, the literal translation, you'll actually have it in the, in the margin of your text. It literally says, the washing of the laver water basin. So that baptism in Jesus' name is the fulfillment of being washed at the laver in the Old Testament. You want to know how to be clean before God? It's by the washing of regeneration. So you got out of the old Adam, which was in your inheritance before. And now that you are in Christ by regeneration, you now have the inheritance of God in your life. You have changed inheritance from death in the old Adam into the inheritance of Jesus Christ himself. Give God praise in the house. How? Because you were regenerated. That means you have the genes of God in you. And the genes of God is pure. If you got God genes in you, you got clean genes in you. But if you haven't been regenerated, then you've got the old genes of Adam in you. And I want to tell you what those genes are. They're dirty genes. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. How many of y'all tonight are thankful for the cleansing power that flows from the threshold from Jesus Christ? Oh, God wants to heal He wants to heal. He wants to bring life to everybody, whosoever will. Amen. He is the cleansing agent. If you don't believe me, and I'm not going to turn there, but Revelation 22, 1 tells you the one who's on the throne is Jesus. All right, y'all with me? Revelation 4. Verse 5 and 6. Woo. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne, there were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So where is the source of that water? Where is the source of that sea of glass? It's the throne. Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, your cleansing cleansing agent is located in heaven. His name is Jesus. All of these things speak of him and the life that he brings to us. You go to Revelation 15, you'll see that sea of glass again. And you see martyrs walking on that sea of glass. And that sea of glass is mingled with fire. Just like the molten sea was created, cast from fire. It speaks of the tribulation that you will go through, the conflicts that you will go through. But God has given you the power in the midst of your tribulation and the conflicts. Even from the Antichrist that would come against you, you're able to overcome that fire of tribulation and stand upon the sea of glass, which is calm as it can possibly be. That's what you're going to see when you get there. Praise the Lord God. And so Ezekiel just gives us a little glimpse into the future before you move into that eternal state 
where the new Jerusalem is. There is no temple there because the new Jerusalem is a cube. It is the Holy of Holies. And you will be in that forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. How many of y'all are thankful today for the presence of God? And so as you stand, I present to you as a member of the fivefold ministry, a man that is an apostolic preacher, I present to you cleansing tonight. And his name is Jesus. In fact, Colossians 3, we preach it to you Sunday morning and Sunday night. He is our life. He is our life. He is your cleansing agent. And that's all you need to know to go forth in victory and make it through every battle that you face. But before I let you go, let me just tell you the rest of this chapter is in the book of Ezekiel and we'll be done. But after he gets through presenting this awesome, glorious event of the waters flowing from the throne and showing you that it takes baptism in water and it takes spirit baptism, which those are a picture of, and life, salvation, to enter into his presence. Then God talks about the division of the land. I already talked to you about the holy oblation. I talked to you about the size of the holy oblation. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but that's what it ends with. It gives you the dimensions of the holy oblation. It talks to you about the allotment, allotment to the priest, allotment to the Levites. Huge allotments from God in that time so that they could minister in the presence of God. And then it goes on and it tribe, one tribe after another is recorded about where they're going to be located in the future kingdom. And when you study it, the old tribal boundaries that Israel had in the past are completely gone. And God sets up a brand new thing where every tribe, it, it, the Bible gives you the, their location from east to west. Amen. From east to west, east to west, east to west. And those tribes are paralleling all the way east to west. Doesn't even tell you how big the land's going to be that each one of them will have. It gives you a little boundary here and a little boundary there. That's why I say any map that you would look at right now is most likely, unless it's something that's really very carefully done, is not an accurate map. Because we don't have the sizes of those tribal allotments. But we know that they run from east to west and they're parallel just like this. Amen. And the holy oblation, the presence of God, is right there in the center. Amen. And that's what those chapters deal with. But at the very last verse of the book of Ezekiel is the point of the whole book. It was round about 18,000 measures. And the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. Amen. Yahweh Shammah. Shammah, right? Am I saying it right? The Lord is present or the Lord is thither. Amen? Amen. Oh, praise God. Amen. The book of Ezekiel, we started preaching to you and God showed that their confidence in once saved, always saved was, was not rooted in Scripture. But everything that they used doctrinally to prove once saved, always saved. And you can go back and listen to the message that we preached in the past. Everything that they used to try to prove once saved, always saved. Even in the midst of sin, living like the devil, living like the world, they still believed they were saved. God said, no, you're going to lose all of that. But then in the end of the book of Ezekiel, God says, guess what? I'm going to restore it all back. I'm going to restore everything that you've lost. But it's all in Jesus Christ. So tonight I preach to a church, and I can tell you, the Lord is present. And he is your cleansing. He is your savior. Walk out in victory and remain faithful to the Lord to the end. Let's give God praise. Father, mighty God, I felt your spirit, Lord. The moment I stepped in this pulpit tonight, those rivers that flow out of your people right now, they're flowing right now. Out of your bellies, just like out of the bellies of those oxen. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This make he of the Spirit that they that believe in him should receive. Let that water, that cleansing water of his Spirit flow through you right now. Be a channel. Don't damn it up. Don't stop it. Let it flow through you right now. As you begin to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gives utterance. That river of life is flowing through you. Don't stop it up.
I've been baptized in waters that were too deep. I do want to say this one thing the Holy Ghost is reminding me. Because in 1 Kings chapter 7, the Bible says there were 2,000 baths in that molten sea. 2,000 baths. In Chronicles chapter 4 and verse 5, it said it had 3,000 baths. There is no contradiction in the Word of God. Why in one place does it say 2,000 baths? In the other place it says 3,000 baths. Because when it's full to the brim, it's 3,000 baths. But the normal capacity that they would fill it with was 2,000 baths. And so what God is saying is this. Is that the cleansing that Jesus Christ provides for us today will give us everything we need to make it through two days of the church age. And at the t- after two days, the third day, will be the perfect day. And the third day is the kingdom age. Well, he will raise us up and we'll live in his sight. So that third day, the kingdom age, he says, I'm going to give you enough cleansing for two days, two ba- 2,000 years. And I'm going to add another 1,000 years to it. So that not only can I cleanse you in the church age, but I'll cleanse you in the kingdom age. And ultimately what he's showing you is that he'll take care of that cleansing from age to age forever eternally because it's round in circumference. And then when you look at Ezekiel, the Bible talks about 4,000, 4 times 1,000 links that he was taking into the waters. So if you take the two, are you with me? The 2,000 plus the 1,000 baths in the molten sea, 3,000. I'm in. Church age, kingdom age. You add four days, 4,000 cubits, four to that, you have how many? Seven. So what God has shown you by all these numbers, by the original one that he gave in 1 Kings 7 and then Chronicles 4 verse 5, he's given you a picture of what is coming in the kingdom the seventh day. May the Lord bless you real good. I, if it wasn't the Holy Ghost, I would have forgot all about that. But... He's letting you know he's got it all taken care of from age to age to age to age. I love y'all so much.